Dear students, welcome to Hooray. This is your introduction class, which means we are going to give you a briefing. We will let you know the modules of IELTS and the basic tips and techniques for the modules. I'm going to share a screen with you. I will share a PPT on my screen and I will explain reading module first. This is our logo, Hooray. Welcome to Hooray once again. And all the best for your training for the IELTS. Hooray stands for Educating Minds and Crafting Futures. We do overseas education for those students who wish to study abroad. And we also train people who want to do general module, who want to go abroad and work while you get a PR. Let's look at what is the full form of IELTS. IELTS stands for International English Language Testing System. This is a test which tests you, it's a testing system which tests your English language proficiency at an international level. IELTS has four modules, and in IELTS, they also call these as components. In the paper-based test, there's writing first, followed by listening and reading. And the last module is speaking. Speaking is done on a different day. It is not done on the same day as the writing, listening, and reading. There is another option by which way you can give your exam, and that is the computer-based test. The computer-based test, the CBT, order is listening, reading, writing, and speaking. So for the paper-based test, it starts off with writing, followed by listening, then reading, and speaking on a different day, which may be either up to one week before your exam or after your exam. The CBT test order is listening, write, reading, writing, and speaking. That is LRWS for the computer-based test. Now we will look at the reading bits first, and then I will explain to you with uh, an exercise as to how to go about doing a reading exercise. The IELTS reading module is for 60 minutes, that is one hour. There are 40 questions, and each correct answer carries one mark. There will be three passages or sections. In the academic book, they would be written as passage one, reading passage two, and reading passage three. Whereas in the general books, it would be written section one, section two, and section three. Each section or passage contains about 13 questions. So there'll be 13 into three will be 39, and there'll be one extra question in one of the passages. So that is 39 plus one, 40. So there will be 40 questions totally, and all these 40 answers the 40 marks will be corresponding to a band score, which we will share with you later. There is a band conversion table prescribed by IDP, and your score will be converted into a band of one to nine. One being the lowest and nine being the highest. Difficulty of these passages increases in ascending order. That means the first passage is okay, the second is a little tougher, and the third passage is this will not be in order most of the time, which means the questions one to six, for example, answers will not be corresponding in the paragraphs one to three. The second answer may be in the first paragraph, or the first answer may be in the second paragraph, and so on. All the answers are contained in the text, though, 
So you don't need prior knowledge for any of the topics. Even if you're new to a topic, you still have the possibility of getting full marks. That is 40 out of 40. You can score full marks because all the data, all the information is provided in these three passages. There's no extra time to transfer your answers to the OMR sheet. So you have to directly transfer your answers to your answer sheet as you're doing the reading test. So while you're reading, you can use your question paper or your question booklet to underline key points and then write your answers only once on the OMR sheet. The OMR sheet will be provided by the test center. This is a sample of the OMR sheet. There will be rows and columns. You have to write your answers corresponding to these question numbers. You'll have to fill in your details at the top. And there are numbers already printed here from 1 to 20 and 21 to 40. This is how the OMR answer sheet looks. You have to write your answers all on this OMR answer sheet for reading only once. Write with pencil in capital letters because if you make an error, you can always easily erase it with an eraser and change it. And the reason why you have to write in capital letters is that uh, the letters will be distinct and clear, so you don't get any spelling error and uh, lose marks for that. Do not write answers on the question paper because you will not get separate time to write your answers later. There comes a difference between general reading and academic reading. In general reading, they're called sections. The first section will be factual, and there'll be two texts usually based on hotel advertisements or any small information in boxes, probably. You'll have to look at those pictures or images and data or passages or articles and answer the questions. So section one, questions one to 13 will be divided into two shorter texts. Similarly, in section two, the topic will be more discursive in nature. There will be again two short passages or texts or articles. And usually here, the topics are based on work, work-related issues, applying for a job or company policies, pays and conditions, etc. And the third section is one long passage. It's not divided into two. So questions 14 to 26 would be section two and questions numbers 27 to 40 would be section three. For this third section, it would be one long passage and it's more of analytical nature covering general topics of interest. So there will be 40 questions here for the general reading. In the academic reading, as you can see on the right side, there are no tinier passages. You will have three long passages and all the passages will be quite long and they're not divided into smaller articles like you have in the general reading paper. The first passage will generally be of literary prose. The second passage would be on fiction. And the third passage would be on social sciences and humanities. The details will differ, but the structure is more, is more or less the same. This is the pattern of the questions in the academic reading passages. Now let's go to the next slide. Let's look at the question types that you would get in reading. You would get fill in the blanks questions where you'll have a written text or a table and you will have to fill in the gaps. They will not write the question as fill in the gaps, but the question will be written as complete the table below or complete the text below. And you will have matching headings to written text where you'll have a paragraph, uh, a long paragraph, and um, the passage will be divided into smaller paragraphs. So the paragraphs could be labeled as A, B, C, D, E. So if you have five paragraphs, you would have seven or eight options, which, the, which will be headings. Now your task is to match these headings with the paragraph. So you have to read the first the, the heading and then go to paragraph A, Look at one paragraph, focus on the first and last sentence of the paragraph and understand what is the main idea, main theme of the paragraph. Then you come back and look at the headings and see which heading would be most appropriate for that passage. 
Once you select one number for that, you have to write the question number in your answer sheet. And then you have to go to the next passage. When you go to the next paragraph, again, skim through the entire paragraph and focus on the first and last sentences because the first sentence of a paragraph would tell you what the paragraph is talking about. And the last sentence of the paragraph would always summarize the paragraph. So this gives you a good idea of what is the main theme of the paragraph. However, you have to skim through the entire paragraph to know what the content is also. But you have to be very quick. Do not take too much time for these questions. Skimming is the only skill that you will require on this. Quickly understand the main ideas and go back to the topics and then choose which is the most relevant top, uh, heading for that topic or for that passage of paragraph. Now, once you select one number for that particular paragraph, because each paragraph is unique. Then you have questions like completing the sentence or completing a summary. It is also a fill in the blank kind of question where you'll have a sentence and you'll have a blank. So you need to find out what the word is from the text, read the sentence and also look for uh, keywords, keep underlining the uh, keep underlining keywords over here. So this is another question type. Giving short answers to open questions would be a question and you would have to give a short answer. You have to see how many numbers, uh, letters, number of words you can use and then write your answers. Answer multiple choice questions, that is MCQ to a particular text or a person. You have true, false, not given question and yes, no, not given question. If the question is written as true, false, not given, you have to write the answer as true, false, not given. If the answer is yes, no, you have to answer as yes, no. If you interchange them, you will not get a score for that. You will get a zero mark for that. So please take care as to not to write the opposite way. And also you should not write short forms like T, F, N, G or Y, N, N, G. If for true, false, not given, if the sentence, meaning of the sentence is same as that of in the text, you mark it as true. If the meaning is opposite, you mark it as false. And if the answer is not given or if only partial information is given, you mark it as not given. Let's look at some reading tips here. First, you have to read the instructions carefully because you would want to know how many words you can write and you have to write exactly how many words they have prescribed, nothing more than that. So suppose they write that you can choose no more than three words from the text. You have to write no more than three words. The answer can be two words or one word, but it should never be more than three words. If they write in the instruction, you can write, uh, choose no more than two words and slash oblique a number from the text. So you have to choose your word from the text and you have to write two words if you require a number, the number is in addition to the words. So it would be two words plus a number. Two words plus a number. So two words and a number. But if name uh, words are not required, you can just write a number. So you can just write one number. That's just fine. You need to look at also what the question type is, what the task is. Understand it before you start addressing the questions. So reading instructions is very important. You could answer the longest passage first as it is the toughest. I told you the third passage is usually the toughest. So if you want to address that first and then go to the other passages, that's just fine. Usually the IDP and uh, authoritative bodies who conduct the exam recommend that you take 15 minutes for the first passage, 20 minutes for the second passage and 25 minutes for the third passage. But in case you want to take a little more time for the third and the, the toughest passage, you can Make up your time, adjust your time for the remaining passages. Begin by reading the questions, then skim the passage or vice versa. So it's good to look at the questions first and then go and read the passage so that you can save time. You don't have to read the entire passage because the whole passage may, uh, in all three passages, one, two, and three, it comes to almost 2,500 to 3,000 words. So you don't have to read all the words. If you know what the questions are, you can focus on only those parts of the passages which would give you the answer. Scan for specific information. Whenever you want to look for details, you have to do scanning. Scanning is a skill where you look for details, you look for specific pieces of information. So scanning would require for detailed questions. Use the summarization technique where you can summarize each paragraph to understand what 
each paragraph talks about. So you'll have a general topic on the top of the passage, but each paragraph would cover some aspects of that main topic. Eliminate rereading of words while skimming. So while you're doing quick reading, skimming is quick reading. So while you're doing skimming, when you're reading fast, that is, you should not go back and read what you've already read because that will slow you down. So to be an effective speed reader, you have to eliminate rereading while you're doing skimming. But while you're doing scanning and looking for details, at that time, it is advised that you go back and read that sentence two or three times, which you didn't understand. Maybe it's a complex sentence. You want to understand it better. So at that time, for sure, you have to read it one or two times or maybe three times. But while you're doing skimming, please don't go back and reread the sentence. You want to be fast and you have to be fast because in 60 minutes you have to finish 40 questions. So speed is a very important criteria. Use peripheral vision. Peripheral vision means looking outside the borders. So when you move to the next one and start processing it in your mind so that you can read faster. It's a time-saving technique. Use a timer when reading. Always keep an alarm when you start your reading test and make sure you complete your passages on time. Because in the exam, you will not get even one second more. So during training, please make it a point to keep a timer whenever you do a reading test and see that you do not write any answers after the ending of one hour. If you're strict with yourself during training, the exam will be easier for you. It is important to practice the tests in the exam uh, style or pattern so that you can be prepared well to do your examination. Use key synonyms to identify answers. A lot of the time, they do not give the answers very directly. So the questions would have, a, have certain words and different words would be given in the passage. Those different words will mean the same. A uh, synonym is a, they are words, synonyms are words which are different but give the similar meaning. So you have to identify the words in the question and in the passage, identify what are the synonyms and choose your answer from that part of the passage. And you also have to be equipped with rich vocabulary. Your vocabulary should be rich because that English IELTS is an English test it's a language exam. So the more vocabulary you have, the more word power you have, you're going to get a better words which may be tough or you're not used to it. They're literary words. So you have to get used to them and familiar with them and learn their meanings during your training. So the better equipped you are with vocabulary, the easier it will be for you to identify and write your answers. Points are lost for incorrect spelling. But for reading, you will not get incorrect spelling unless someone is very careless because all the answers are given in the passages. All the answers should be just copied with the correct spelling. Now let's look at the next slide. The next slide is going to take you to the test where you're going to uh, look at a, a reading passage. So with this, we come to the end of the, the briefing or the theoretical aspects of your briefing session of reading. Thank you for listening. Now I'm going to share a screen with you and I'm going to share the questions and answers of a reading passage. So this will help you to do a test practically. Thank you.
Now I'm going to share my screen with you and I'll show you the reading passage from book 10 general. This book is in your Dropbox. It is book 10, general. Up to book 10, there are academic and general reading questions together. And there are two general reading tests. This is test A from book 10. The PDF book page number is 99 and this book page number is 104. The first reading passage is smoke alarm in the home. Now, if we look at the questions for this particular passage, the question, the, it reads in the passage itself. So first you need to read the instruction. Section one is for questions one to 14. However, like we saw in general reading, they would have two smaller texts. So for the first text or first passage, which is smoke alarms in the home, we have to read the text below. That is this text and answer questions one to seven. So from this passage, we are only going to answer questions one to seven. Let's look at question number one. And let's read the instructions as well and see what these questions are about. So these are questions one to seven. I hope you can see my screen. I've enlarged it a little bit. Questions one to seven, what are the instructions? Do the following statements agree with the information given in the text on page 104 in the boxes one to seven on your answer sheet? That is this answer sheet from one to seven, you have to write either true, false or not given. So if the statement is the same as that of in the text, you have to mark it as true. If the meaning of the sentence is the opposite, you have to mark it false. And if the question is, uh, the information in the question is not given, or only partial evidence is given, partial information is given, and we don't know, we cannot prove whether it's true or false. In that case, we have to mark it as not given. So the first question says, all new houses in Australia must have smoke alarms. The answer for this is true. So it says, all new houses in Australia must have smoke alarms. So let's look at the passage, smoke alarms in the home, and we will see why this is true. If you look at the first sentence, it says smoke alarms are now a standard feature in Australian homes and are required by the National Building Code in any recently built properties. So they're saying it is a standard feature. So all the houses in Australia must have smoke alarms because it is a standard feature and it's a requirement by the National Building Code. So the answer is true. The second question is, photoelectric smoke alarms cost less than ionization smoke alarms. So they're saying photoelectric smoke alarms, one type of smoke alarm, cause, costs less than the ionization smoke alarms. But this is a false statement because if you look at the passage, in the second paragraph it says, there are two principal types of smoke alarms. Ionization alarms are the cheapest and most readily available smoke alarms. So if you see that they're saying in the question that photoelectric smoke alarms cost less, less, but smoke, uh, photoelectric smoke alarms do not cost less because they're saying ionization smoke alarms are the cheapest. So nothing can be cheaper than that. So smoke alarm, photoelectric smoke alarms cannot be cheaper. Therefore, that is a false statement. So the answer for this statement is false. The third question is, it takes a short time to fit smoke alarms, most smoke alarms. It takes a short time to fit most of the smoke alarms in the house. But that information is not given in the text, so we have marked it as not given. The fourth question says, any hardwired smoke alarm must be fitted by a specialist technician. 
The answer for this is true because if you look at the text, we look at where it talks about who has to fit the electric alarm. It says here in the next paragraph, for the installation of high wire, hard wired smoke alarms powered from the mains electricity supply. However, you will need the services of a licensed professional. So yes, a licensed professional and they use a synonym in the question. In the question they say specialist technician. So a licensed professional who's a specialist technician has to be there and they have to, they must and have to and should fit the smoke alarm because it involves uh, mains electricity, electric supply and which is a professional job. So the answer is true. Now let's look at the fifth question. The fifth question says, you should get in touch with your local council before placing any ionization smoke alarms in household rubbish. This answer is false because it says here in the next paragraph, if you have more than 10 to dispose of, you should contact your local council. So there's a condition here that only if there are more than 10 smoke alarms to be disposed of, only then the person has to contact the local council, not otherwise. Whereas in the question it says, you should get in touch with your local council before placing any, any, any of the alarms. So if you look at this fifth question, it says you should get in touch with your local council before placing any ionization smoke lamps, any of them, in the household rubbish. Whereas there, they say only if there are 10 or more. So this answer is false. The next question is, smoke alarms give a warning sound to indicate that battery power is low. The answer is true. Let's look at the passage. It says in the next paragraph, your battery powered smoke alarm will produce beep of every here they say an alarm and the passage they say beep so you see there are a lot of synonyms and parallel expressions used listening also they will use a lot of question the seventh question says old smoke alarms need to be checked once or more than once a month whereas that information is not given in the passage so it is marked as not given now let's go to the next passage questions age to 14, which is the same section, but it has a different article from where we have to choose the answers. Here the instruction says questions age to 14. I'll enlarge it a little bit for you to see. Questions eight to 14. The text on page 106 has seven sections. Which section mentions the following? <laughs> information they give you question EFG and they're asking this question from which section or which passage A to G does this information come from where is it extracted from write the correct letter so please note that you have to only write the letter and not any words you have to write the letter A to G so out of the seven paragraphs you just write the letter A to G next to that corresponding Number. So one to seven, we have done true, false, not given. You will write your true, false, not given. From eight, you will write A to G. A to G from eight, nine, ten up to 14. So the first, and it also says here that you have to write your answers on your answer sheet only, not in your question booklet, only in this poem answer sheet. Note, you may use any letter more than once because there are only seven paragraphs, but there are more questions. So any piece of information could be repeated. Uh, the information 
the different pieces of information could come from the same paragraph. So a paragraph may have two different pieces of information and you, for, you would have to write the same letter, the same paragraph letter twice. So don't worry if some paragraphs are left out or some paragraphs have two answers, that's just fine. The eighth question says, discounts available to younger visitors. So it talks about Sydney Opera House Tours. Now they're talking about discounts being available to young visitors or younger visitors in the Sydney Opera House. Now let's go to that passage. This is the Sydney Opera House Tours. And if you see here, it says, read the text below and answer questions 8 to 14. So this passage is for answers 8 to 14. Now the eighth question's answer comes here. It says concessions. It's mentioned concessions, Australian seniors and pensioners, students and children of 16 and under uh, 24 $24.50 dollars. So they are giving a concession here. So discount is another word for concession. It's a synonym. So the question says discounts are available to younger visitors. That is in C paragraph. So you have to write the letter C against the question number eight. You just write C because it is extracted from the paragraph C. Let's look at the ninth question. The need for suitable footwear. That comes in paragraph E. So let's look at paragraph E. This is paragraph E here. It talks about here. The tour includes up to 300 steps. Flat rubber sole shoes must be worn. So they're specifying the need to wear some suitable footwear. They're saying to climb these steps, only flat rubber sole shoes must be worn. Therefore, it is important to look for synonyms here and see they say suitable footwear and here they're saying flat rubber sole shoes. So you have to look for synonyms and parallel expressions in order to find your answer. So always you will not find the answers directly. You have to find the answers using synonyms and parallel expressions. So for this question, you have to write E next to the number nine in the box nine. You just have to write the letter E because it is extracted from the paragraph E. Let's look at question number 10. Question 10 says, the opportunity to pretend you are taking part in a concert. The answer for this is D because if we look at paragraph D here, you see it says that the backstage tour gives you backstage access to the Sydney Opera House. It is a unique opportunity to exercise the real life dramas behind the stage. So it's giving the person a chance to do a rehearsal behind the stage, which means they are acting. So it is, they're pretending as if they're taking part in the concert. They're not really taking part in the concert on the stage, but they're doing a rehearsal under backstage. So it gives the person the opportunity to exercise or experience the real life drama behind the stage. So they're just pretending that they're taking part in the concert. So D has to be written in the next box. Let's look at question number 11. A restriction on the number of participants. That's again from par uh, paragraph E. I told you there can be some answers from the same paragraph. So you see in nine, it's also E, 11 also. This piece of information is extracted from the paragraph E. Now, if we look at paragraph E, it says, the question says the restriction on the number of participants. You see here it says to purchase, bookings are essential, limited to eight people per tour. So it is restricted. So here in the text, they say limited to eight people per tour, whereas in the question it says a restriction on the number of participants. Participants are the people in the tour and restricted 
Here they say restriction in the, in the question, in the passage it says limited. So see how they use the synonyms. So you always got to keep your eyes open for the synonyms. Now let's look at the 12th question. The 12th question says, a reduction that applies to purchases using the internet. That again comes from paragraph C. So you have eighth question also from C and the 12th question is also from C. The question says a reduction that applies to purchases using the internet. If you look at the C paragraph, it says prices, adults, $35 and online, $29.7. So $29.7 is the reduction that applies to the purchases using internet. Online means using internet. Again, you have a parallel expression or a synonym. So the reduction is if someone applies online, they get a reduction. Otherwise, the ticket for the adult is $35. Let's go to the 13th question. The need to book your ticket in advance. This also is extracted from paragraph E. It says here, online sales expire at 4.30 p.m. two days prior. So they're saying that there's a need to book your ticket in advance because the bookings will close two days prior to the Opera House show. So it is extracted from paragraph E. Then we have the last question in this section, which is 14. The 14th question says, the length of one of the tours, this comes in paragraph G. They're talking about the length of the tour. Now here again, they use a synonym. It says duration, whereas in the question it says the length of the tour. What's the length of the tour? 1.5 hours. So it's one and a half hours. That is the length of the tour. So this answer is in G. With this, we come to the end of the first section in the reading, questions 1 to 14. As we saw, it is divided into two smaller passages, and this is how you need to read the instructions, the questions, underline the key points. As you see here, the keywords are underlined. So as you go along marking your answers or reading through the questions and passages, underline the keywords in the questions and in the passage. This will enable you to find the answers faster. Thank you for paying attention to the first section. We will shortly go on to the second section.
Now let's look at section two in the same reading test, which started with smoke alarms from smoke alarms in the home. This is the second section. I hope you all can see my screen. I'll just make it a little smaller so that you can see also the heading, section two. Section two, questions 15 to 27. Read the text below. I'll zoom it in a little more. Using Reading, read the text below and answer questions 15 to 21. The whole passages section is 15 to 27, but this article is from 15 to 21. Using direct mail to sell your product. Let's look at questions 15 to 21. We have to read the instruction first, and then we have to look at the keywords in the question and find the answers. Question number 15 says, Sales letters should be sent to the dash in the company. So what are you supposed to do? Choose no more than two words from the text for each answer. It's important to follow these instructions. It says no more than two words. So the answer can be two words or one word, but should not be three words. It should not exceed two words. And it also says from the text. So your answers have to be from the text. You should not use your own words or write a different word, which means the same. You are not allowed to use synonyms in your answers. Your answers have to be directly extracted from the text and written. Write the answers in the boxes 15 to 21. So here we have the boxes 15 to 21. You have to write these answers. Sales letters should be sent to the dash in a company. So where should the sales letters be sent? In the passage, in the second paragraph, in the second last line it says, if you are contacting a business, it is important to address the letter to the decision maker, ideally, by name or by at least the job title. So the question is sales letters. Here they don't say sales letters in the passage. They say if you're contacting a business. So that's a sales letter. You have to address the letter. Address means what the, the letter should be sent to that person. So it should be addressed. In the question it says the, less, the letter should be sent to. Sent to who? Addressed is the same meaning. It has to be addressed to, it has to be sent to. To who? To the decision maker. So decision maker is two words, so you can write decision maker in the blank. This is a complete completion of questions. As we saw, the type of question is complete the sentences below. All right. Now the 16th question says, your letter should make as much dash as possible. Your letter should make as much dash as possible. So this could be a verb here. You need to make, it has to make something or uh, it has to, some action is being done here. So let's look at which is a suitable answer for this. We look at the third paragraph. While the desirability and price of the product on offer will obviously influence sales, you also need to gain the maximum impact from your sales letter. So the maximum means in the question it says, as much as possible as much as means to the maximum so what is the uh, what has to be made impact has to be made so impact is the correct answer your letter should make as much impact as possible that means it should make the maximum impact which is possible question number 17 the reader's attention 
needs to be caught by the dash of your letter. So they're saying the reader's attention, the way you write the letter, the reader's attention has to be caught. And that comes here. The opening is, I hope this screen is visible. It comes in this paragraph. Next, first bullet point. The opening is crucial to attract their attention. And so they don't lose interest. Avoid having too much text. The opening is crucial to attract the attention. So the reader's attention, there's a keyword which is the same here, which is attention. Here they say the reader's attention needs to be caught. And here they say that the, the opening of the letter is crucial to attraction uh, to attract the attention of the reader. So they're just changing or rephrasing the sentence. The opening, opening is the keyword. So you can underline this as you're reading and you see what is the missing word caught by doing what of the letter by reading. The attention is caught. And here they say attract. Attract is to catch attention. So there's parallel expressions. Okay, next is question number 18. Letters should be sent in a dash. Letters should be sent in what? It says here in the second bullet point, try to send each mailing in a white envelope. So send is a common word. Letters should be sent in what? Try to send. So send is a word. So you can understand the answer comes from that sentence. Try to send each mailing in a white envelope. So white envelope should be written in the blank space. 19. It is best to print the dash in two or more colors. So what has to be printed in two or more colors? Question number 19. Here it says, include a dash. And then it says, depending on the volume and whether you can afford the cost, try to use at least two color printing for this. This is what is a it is a pronoun relating to brochure because they say include a brochure. And then they're describing that brochure. How should it be? Depending on the volume, how much is there to be printed and on whether you can afford the cost, if it's affordable, try to use at least two color printing for this. So for this means for the brochure. So the answer should be brochure because it says it is best to print the dash in two or more colors. Question number 20. Consider sending a dash as this is more effective than a picture. Consider sending a dash as this is more effective than a picture. So we have to find out what is more effective than a picture. It says here in the next sentence in the same paragraph, if practical, if practical, so they're saying if it's possible, consider it may be worth enclosing a free sample. This is a much greater incentive than photographs. So it's greater incentive means what? It is more effective than what? Than a picture. Here they say than photographs. In the question, they say than a picture. So again, they're using a synonym here. So what are they supposed to send? A sample. So if you write sample, it's also good enough. But if you write free sample, it's also correct. Both would be considered correct because you are allowed to write two words maximum. So you can write sample or free sample. Both would be considered correct. The next question is number 21. You should calculate the dash to your letter. You should calculate the dash to your letter. So what are we supposed to calculate? 21. Next bullet point. When you receive your replies, assess your response rate and monitor the sales. So assess is another word for calculate. So what should you calculate? Your The response rate to the letter. 
So when you received a, your reply, so that means you've sent a letter and you're receiving your replies. So you should calculate the dash to your letter. What should you assess? What should you calculate? Your response rate. So response rate is the answer. You can write two words. So that is the 21st answer. Now let's go to the next passage. Within the same section, we have another passage. As I told you, for the section two, you will have two passages. So this passage addresses question numbers 22 to 27. You look at the instruction here. Read the text below and answer questions 22 to 27. This passage is about job specification, communications manager. So let's look at the questions first, see what the instructions are, and then we'll find the answers for these questions. The question, um, uh, question task is written here on top. You can see it's written questions 22 to 27. Complete the notes below. So you have some notes here and you have to complete them. It also is a fill in the blanks kinds of question, kind of question, but you will have a longer passage. It's a, it's a kind of notes, which is all in continuation with the details given on job specifications. Choose no more than two words. So you're, you're, you're allowed to write no more than two words. So it can be two words or one word, not more than that from the text. So your answers have to be again from the text. You can't use your own words. Write your answers in the boxes 22 to 27. So here we came to 22 to 27. So in these boxes, you've got to write your answers. Position, communications manager, summary of role to improve IFCESs dash around the world. So the answer is profile or international profile. If you look at the first paragraph, it talks about IFCES, the International Federation of Chemical Engineering Societies. So IFCES stands for the expansion is International Federation of Chemical Engineering Societies. So there's some job specifications given here for communications manager. So the first question says, the summary of the role to improve IFCS is this organization's dash around the world. So this job summary, the job summary, the summary of the role. So in the question, it says summary of role. Here it says job summary. So the answers from this paragraph, to raise the dash of IFCES to raise what? The international profile. So if you write international profile, it would be correct. If you also write only profile, that would be accepted as correct as well. So the answer can be no more than two words. You write profile, it is the noun. Uh, but if you give an adjective to the noun, it's also accepted because it's within the word limit. So profile and international profile are correct answers here. Question number 23. Writing for a number of dash produced for both IFCES and a wider readership. Responsibilities include, now we have to look at the responsibilities of this for this position, writing for a number of dash produced for both IFCES and a wide readership. So a person taking up this job will have responsibilities. So here in the passage, it says key responsibilities. In the question, it says responsibilities include. What does it include? It includes writing for a number of dash produced. So something going to be produced. So what is it in the third bullet point? Write an edit copy for what? For publications intended for internal and external use, including chemical engineer monthly. So here they say, Internal, internal and external use, whereas in the question they say it's produced for both IFCES, which is internal, which is that company's name, and a wider readership. Wider readership is for external. So the answer you would choose here is publications because it's written writing for a number of dash. It is going to be produced. So write an edit copy for what? For pro pro publications. Question number 24. Making sure the dash contains current information. So you have to make sure that something contains correct information. What is that? It comes here on the two, three bullet points below that. It says ensure. How do you know the answers from here? Because in the question it says making sure and here they write ensure, which means same, they're parallel expressions. So what should you ensure? That the website content 
contains correct information. So ensure website content is up to date. Up to date means current information. Again, they're using parallel expressions. So your answer would be website content. Question 25. Here they're talking about employee specifications. What is essential? What does that include? Now, to get this job, what are the specifications a person should have? What are the requirements? High-level skill in writing ap appropriately for the dash to read. So the person who wants this job should have the skill to write appropriately to be able to dash, for the dash to read. So for who to read, you have to find out from who to read. It comes here on the right side column. Excellent copywriting skills with strong attention to detail, a keen sense of audience, and an ability to tailor writing to its particular purpose. So a keen sense of audience. So for who to read? Audience. Audience are the people who are going to read this copy and these publications, what they're going to write. So their writing skills should be appropriate. Here they say the writing skills with strong attention to detail. That means it has to be appropriate with a keen sense of the audience. Audience should be in the mind of the writer when they're writing because addressing the audience. So for who to read? The audience. So the answer is audience. 26. To achieve a specific dash, to achieve a specific purpose. So this is completing notes. So it's all come continuing, continuing as in bullet points. So it continues in the same sentence and an ability to tailor writing to its particular purpose. So specific means particular, to achieve means it is tailored to that particular, to achieve that purpose. So the answer purpose is here. In the question they say to achieve a specific purpose, here it says tail, it, it has the person, it should have an ability to tailor write to its particular purpose. Then we go to question 27. Good IT skills are another skill which is required, specification. Now it talks about the employee specification, desirable includes. What the specification includes? Relevant qualifications at dash level. So here they're talking about the qualification. Here they give about the qualification, the desirable. So in the bracket, they wrote desirable in the question. So you know this is under the question desirable. Recognized postgraduate qualification in public relations, journalism, marketing, communication. So the answer here would be postgraduate because level is qualification. Level is already printed in the answer. So you just write postgraduate. You don't have to write qualification because in the question, it is written already level. So that is the qualification. So you see a dash level, postgraduate level. This is a hyphenated word in the text. Hyphenated words are counted as one word, not two words. Now let's go to the next section, section three. So we've completed questions from 15 to 27. We're going to move to the third section, which contains questions 28 to 40. I'm once again going to share my screen with you and I'll show you the section three passage, which is here. I'll enlarge the screen a little bit. I hope you can read this. It's a section three, questions 28 to 40. Read the text on pages 112 and 113 and answer 
questions 28 to 40. This passage is on Kauri Gang. As I told you earlier in section three, you'll just have one long passage. You will not have two smaller articles. So questions 28 to 40, that's all these studying questions are based on this passage only. This paragraph or passage is on Kauri Gang. It's a piece of New Zealand's history. Let's look at question number 28. We have to read the instructions first and see what the task is. The task given here is for questions 28 to 33. That is just for these six questions. The text has six sections, A, B, C, D, E, F. There are six paragraphs. Which section contains the following information? This is called matching information. So you have to match the information of this question to the information in the text. So we have to find out which paragraph has this piece of information. In other words, from which paragraph are they extracting this detail and giving us in the question? Write the correct letter A to F in the boxes 28 to 33. So in this question answer sheet, 28 to 33 would be your answers. And you'll only write the letter, not any words. You just write to, have to write A, B, C, D, E, F. And you may use any letter more than once. It is given in the note here below. Question 28, an example of a domestic product made of high quality gum. So we have to find out in which paragraph they are giving an example of where a domestic product can be made out of high quality gum. Now here, as we saw earlier, the answers will be mixed. They will not be according to the paragraphs. So we could find the answers maybe in a different page, not in the first paragraph. Now, if you look at this second page of the passage, in paragraph E, it says, the first major commercial use of Cori gum was in the manufacture of high grade furniture varnish a kind of clear paint used to treat wood. The best and purest gum that was exported prior to 1910 was used in this way. Now the question is, an example of a domestic product made of high quality gum. They talk about varnish, it's a paint used to treat wood. So this varnish is a furniture varnish. It's used in a domestic, it's not commercial, it's domestic. It is high quality, high grade furniture, varnish, and they say made of high quality gum. Here they say the best and the purest gum that was exported was used in this way. So the question, an example of a domestic product made of high quality gum, they're using the same quality, high quality, the best quality and the, import, the one which is purest, the best form they're using for the production of high grade furniture varnish. So this piece of information is extracted from E paragraph, so you have to write E in the answer. You just have to write E in your answer sheet. You don't have to write any words. The next question is factors affecting gum quality. What are the factors affecting gum quality? This comes in paragraph A. In paragraph A, in this in Paragraph A, there are three smaller paragraphs. If you look at the third paragraph here, it says, gum fresh from the tree. So they talk about the different factors affecting the gum quality. Gum fresh from the tree was soft and of low value, but most of the gum which was harvested had been buried for thousands of years. This gum came in a bewildering variety of colors, degree of transparency and hardness, depending on the length and location of the burial, as well as the health of the original tree and the areas of the bleeding. Highest quality gum was hard and bright and was usually found at shallow depth of the hill, on the hills. Lowest quality gum was soft, black and chalky and sugary and was usually found buried in swamps where it had been in contact with water for a long time. So in this paragraph, they're talking about the different quality, uh, different uh, factors which affect the quality of the gum. They talk about the high quality, the highest quality, then they talk about the lowest quality and they say what are the factors which influence 
the gum quality. Uh, they talk about the, uh, the depending on the length, the location, the transparency, the hardness, where it is buried, in what type of depth of the hills it is found. So all those are the factors. So the answer for this would be A. The 30th question is, how cori gum is formed? How cori gum is formed is also in A paragraph. It comes in the at the end of the first paragraph and the whole of the second paragraph, all which comes under A. In the past, it was the tree sap, the thick liquid which flows inside the tree, which was then hardened into gum, played an important role in New Zealand's early history. So how was it formed? After running from rips or tears in the bark of trees, so bark, the trees are ripped and they're the tone, the sap hardens to form the lumps of gum, which eventually fall to the ground and are buried under layers of forest litter. Litter is all the waste on the forest, under leaves, dry leaves, garbage, all the litter. So all this falls under that. Then the bark often splits where the branches fork from the trunk and gum accumulates there also. So all this explains how cori gum is formed. So the answer is A. You need to write A in your answer sheet. Question number 31, how gum was gathered? Now we saw how gum was formed. Now we have to find out where they're talking about how this gum which they form, how it is gathered. It comes in the next paragraph B. Here it says in Maori and early European times up until 1850, most gum collected was simply picked up from the ground. But after that, the majority was recovered by digging. So what are they saying? How the gum was gathered is a question. And here it says how the gum was collected. How was it collected? Simply picked up from the ground. And after that, it, the remaining portion was uh, recovered by digging. So about gathering, they use a synonym here in the question. They ask how gum was gathered. And, and in the text, it says how gum was, most of the gum was collected. So collected and gathered are synonyms. Let's look at question number 32. So the answer for this is B because it's in B paragraph. 32, the main industrial uses of the gum. So now we have to find out. Earlier we saw about domestic uses. That was in paragraph E. So you can remember that if they're talking about the domestic uses there, mostly the industrial uses would also be in the same paragraph. So now the answer for this is also E. Now if you go to the next page, E, you look here at passage E, right? It says in, I mean, now the question is about the main industrial uses of the gum. The industrial uses starts from here. Cori gum was used in 70% of the oil varnishes being manufactured in England in the 1890s. It was favored ahead of other gums because it was easier to process at lower temperatures. The cooler the process could be kept the better as it meant a paler varnish could be produced. Now it goes in the, continues in the second paragraph in E. About, about the year 1910, cori gum was found to be very suitable, a very suitable ingredient in the production of some kinds of flow covering such as linoleum. In this way, a use was found for the vast quantities of porous quality and less pure gum. That led up till then being discarded as waste. Cori gum's importance in the manufacture of varnish and linoleum was displaced by synthetic alternatives in 1930s. So later they started using this gum for also other alternatives. So all this talks about the industrial use of gum. So the answer is E. Question 33, recent uses of cori gum. Now they talk about when was it most recently used? So let's look at F paragraph. The answer is F. It comes in the second paragraph of passage F. Over the years, Corrigum has also been used in a number of minor products, such as an ingredient in marine glue and candles. In the last decades, it has had a very limited use 
in the manufacture of highly, extremely high grade varnish for violence, but the gum of the magnificent Kauri tree remains an important part of New Zealand's history. So they're talking here about the, the recent uses of Kauri gum. So recently, they're saying over the years, number of other products were also being produced or manufactured using Kauri gum. So this information is in paragraph F. Now, the same text has also questions 34 to 39. Let's look at question 34. I hope this is uh, big enough for you to read. The instruction says, questions 34 to 39, look at the following events in the history of Kauri gum in New Zealand, questions 34 to 39 in bracket, and the list of time periods below. Match the event with the correct time period from A to I. Write the letter. You have to only write the letter A to I. So if you see in the box below, A to I are given as the list of time periods, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, right? From this box, you have to choose the letter, but the letter is corresponding to the time period which is given in the passage. So the question, it says also, write the letter A to I in the answer sheet. You only have to write the answer now from 34 to 39 here in these boxes. Question 34 says, Kauri gum was first used in New Zealand. Now, this is A, before the 1800s. The answer is A. You go to the passage, paragraph A. Oh, not paragraph A. Before the 1800s, yes. Before the 1800s comes in C paragraph. If you look at the C paragraph, it says the original inhabitants of New Zealand, the Maori, had experimented with Kauri gum well before Europeans arrived at the beginning of the 19th century. They called it capia and found it of considerable use. So what is the question here? Kauri gum was first... Kauri gum was first used in New Zealand, first. So the synonym here is the original. Original inhabitants. Original means first. Kauri gum was first used in New Zealand. Here they say the original inhabitants of New Zealand. So you see, there is a synonym or parallel expression here. So you will know the answer is from here. And when did it arrive? Beginning of 19th century. So you see the question, beginning of 19th century. What did they say in the option? A, before the 1800s. Before the 1800s is the beginning of 19th century. So again here, there's no direct answer, but you have to infer the meaning before the 19th century. Beginning of 19th century means before the 1800s, before the 1800s. Now, the 31st, 31st question is the amount of Kauri gum sent overseas peaked. When did the amount of Kauri gum sent overseas peak? In 1900. So the answer for this is B in 1900. Let's look at paragraph D. You see this paragraph D, I think it's a bit, bit too large. I'll make it a bit smaller so that you can read it. It'll fit in the screen. So I've come to paragraph D here. In D paragraph, make it a little bigger. This is D paragraph. The 35th answer is here. The increasing number of diggers resulted in rapid growth of the Kauri gum exports from 1,000 tons to 18 60 to a maximum of over 10,000 tons in 1900. So the question is, the amount of corrigum sent overseas peaked. 
So this thing here, it peaked. It was first only 1,000 tons in 1860, but by 1900, it became 10,000 tons. So it reached a peak. When did it reach maximum of over 10,000 tons? In 1900. So in 1900 is the answer. And that you can see is in paragraph D. And the answer choices in the question is B. Just a minute, let me enlarge the screen. It's become very small. I'll show you the option for this. If you see B, it says in 1900. This is B. Look here, B in 1900. So the amount of corrigum sent OC is peaked. It reached 10,000 tons by 1900. 35th question, 36, the collection of gum, the collection of curry gum supplemented farmers' income. It supplemented the farmers' income. Supplemented means it was used as another, another source of income for the farmers. That is D, between the late 1800s and early 1900s. So that comes in the same 30, in the D paragraph, If you look at this continuation, it says here in this paragraph, the first major commercial use of gum was used in the manufacture of high-grade varnish. And here it says, no, I think it comes in the previous paragraph here. For, the, for 50 years from about 1870 to 1920, Cory gum industry was a major source of income for settlers in northern New Zealand. As these would-be farmers struggled to break in the land, many turned to gum digging to earn enough money to support their families and pay for improvements to their farms until better times arrived. So the farmers were facing some difficulties financially. So they used gum digging as an alternate source to earn enough money to support their families. So when was that? from 1870 to 1920. So in D option, they say the time period was between the late 1800s and the early 1900s. They're not giving the exact time. The exact time in the text is about 1870 to 1920. 1870 to 1920 comes between the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So you have to correlate the time period to that paragraph and write the answer as D. So D is the answer. You have to just write this answer D and not the paragraph number or letter. You have to write the letters from this box only. The next question is Cori gum was made into jewelry. So the answer for this is E. E is between the 1830s and 1900. This answer comes in F paragraph where it talks about how they uh, use Cori gum. In this first paragraph of F, it says fossil, uh, fossil Cori gum is rather soft and can be carved easily with a knife or polished with fine sandpaper. In the time of Queen Victoria of early uh, of England, 1837 to 1901. So Queen Victoria of England's time, 1837 to 1901, some pieces were made into fashionable amber beads that women wore around their necks. So this is jewelry, right? They made some jewelry and which was the time period? 1837 to 1901. So that answer is E. It says between 1830 and 1900. So this comes between 1830 and 1900. So the answer is F. Question number 38. Cori gum was used in the production of string instruments. So musical instruments which have strings, they also use this for that purpose to make these instruments. And when was that? That was I, in recent times. In recent times, so let's look at how they say the recent times. How do they explain this or how do they express the 
synonym for this. So if we look at F paragraph, that is the last paragraph, you see at the end, it says in the last decades. In the last decades means in recent times. So the answer corresponds to I, which says in recent times, but here they say in the last decades. Again, they use parallel expressions. In the last decades, it has been, it has had a very limited use in the manufacture of extremely high grade varnish for violins. But the gum of the magnificent Corriga trees remains an important part of New Zealand's history. So violin is a stringed instrument. It's a musical instrument where strings are used and they used high grade varnish to make this. And when was it? In the last decades. So in recent times is I. Question 39. Most of the quarry gum was found underground. G is the answer. G says after 1850. Now, I told you the answers will be jumbled up. They won't be in order. So this answer comes from paragraph B. If you go back to paragraph B on the first page, we see that it says, in Ma Maori and early European times, up until 1850, most gum collected was simply picked up from the ground picked up from the ground, but after that, the majority was recovered by digging. Digging is what is underground. First, most of the portion, they could just pick up from on top of the ground. It was right on top. It could be seen and they could collect it. But the majority, that means most of the portion was recovered how? By digging. Digging is which is found underground. So they say in the question, most of the quarry gum was found underground. Most of the, and here they say majority, which are synonyms. And they say recovered by digging. In the question, they say found underground. So the answer is G. When is it? After 1850. Here they say up until 1850. Till 1850, it was picked up from on the ground. But after that, they, were, they went and dug and they found the quarry gum. So up until 1850 is mentioned here. So the answer should be after 1850. Because only after 1850, they found the gum underground. Now we come to the last question, 40, which is a different question. It is an MCQ. Question number 40 is given separately. Let's look at the question. It goes further down on the page. Question 40, choose the correct letter A, B, C, or D. So there are four options for this question. You have to select the one which relates best to the question. Write the correct answer in the box on, on your answer sheet. Uh, here, so 40th is the last one, you would answer here. So if you choose to do this third passage first, you would choose to write the answers from here, 28 to 40, according to the passage that you choose. The question here is, what was the most likely, what was most likely to reduce the quality of curry gum? What was the reason which made the quality of the gum to go down, to reduce the quality of gum? The answer is exposure to water. That comes right in the beginning in the passage in paragraph A. We see here at the end of paragraph A in, third, in the third passage. This is paragraph A. There are three paragraphs. If you see the end of the third paragraph, it says highest quality gum was hard, bright and was usually found at shallow depth on the hills. Lowest quality gum. Now the question is about the low quality gum. They're asking what was the li what was likely to reduce the quality of gum. So the answer would be in this portion of the passage. Lowest quality gum was soft, black or chalky and sugary and was usually found buried in swamps where it had been in contact with water for a long time. So what made the quality go down? Because of its exposure to water, because of the contact with water for a long time. For a long time as it's exposed to water for a long time. So the answer here, if you look at the four options, how long it was buried, exposure to water, how deep it was buried, exposure to heat. The answer is exposure to water. So you have to select B. So th with this, we come to the end of one complete reading test of questions 1 to 40. This is how you need to read the instructions. Look for keywords, look for synonyms, parallel expressions, and read the question first, then go to the passage, underline keywords in the passages, and choose your answer. Many times they'll rephrase the question or rephrase the sentence in the passage, but all the answers are provided. So the good thing about this is that 
you don't even need to have prior knowledge to the topic. You will always be able to extract answers if you're a good reader, you're a voracious reader and you can read fast. You'll be able to find all your answers and you can still get 40 out of 40 in your reading test. So I wish you all the best for your reading test. Keep practicing uh, reading tests from book number seven, eight and nine in your Dropbox. That will give you more exposure and experience in uh, answering the questions. Thank you for attending this session. Wish you all the best in the reading section or module for the IELTS exam. Thank you. Hello students, welcome back to the briefing session. Now we are going to address the listening module, which is the second module in the written test and is the first module in the computer-based test. I'm going to share a PPT with you and I will explain the brief tips and techniques on listening. And then we will look at the answers and how to find the answers for the question for one of the tests. Let me share my screen with you now. The listening test is a 40 minute test. I hope this screen is visible to you all. Let me just zoom it in a little bit. There are four parts in the listening test and it has 40 questions. Each part has 10 questions. So question one to 10 is part one. Question 20, 11 to 20 is part two. Questions 21 to 30 is part three, and questions 21, 31 to 40 is part four. The audio will be played continuously without a break. However, they'll give you a little while, a time of about one minute or half a minute to go through certain question numbers. Otherwise, there's no break between the four parts. The audio will be played continuously, and the student should listen, read, and write simultaneously. So there's some multitasking to do here. The entire audio of 40 questions will take about 30 minutes. And at the end of this 30 minutes, there will be 10 minutes provided to you to transfer your answers from your question booklet to your answer sheet. But as you saw that in reading that is not done because the answers are all available in the passages. You can refer to the passages at any time. Whereas in the listening test, you cannot refer to what is already spoken because the entire audio is played only once. The recording will be played only once. You cannot stop the audio clip. You cannot rewind it. It will only play, move forward, and it will move from 1 to 10, etc. You cannot stop the audio, and you cannot rewind it, and you cannot listen to it more than once. So because you are listening to the audio only once, you need to pay attention carefully and Write your answers very fast. Now, how you do it is up to you. You can write some short forms. You can write some codes. You can write some abbreviations. In whatever way you remember, you can write your answers. So after you're finishing your 40 answers, you are provided with 10 minutes time to take those answers which you wrote in your rough copy, in your booklet. You transfer it to this OMR answer sheet, the listening OMR answer sheet is similar to the reading one where you have to fill in your details here at the beginning and you have to write your answers from 1 to 20 here and 21 to 40 over here. So while you transfer your answers, same like reading, you have to write all your answers with pencil in capital letters. The reason why you write with pencil is so that you can erase and change any answer if you wish to. And the reason why you write in capital letters is for the letters to be distinct and clear so that there's no confusion between the letters like O should not look like A or I should not look like E, they should be very clear. So when you write in capital letters, there will not be any confusion and you will not get any spelling errors. Some time is given to go through questions. For example, from one to five, they may give you half a minute to go through the questions. So you go through questions one to five or six to 10 and so on. And at the end of each part, at the end of each uh, part, at like 10, 20, 30, and 40, at that time, you will get 30 seconds to provide, uh, to go through your answers 
and check for spellings, check for anything you've left out by mistake or you didn't catch a word, you couldn't understand something, you can go back and you can take a guess. The total time allotted uh, in the part four will be all together. So at the end of each section, for each section, you'll get five, uh, five questions at a time to look at. But for the part four, which is 31 to 40, the time allotted will be all together. There will not be break in between. So they will say something like, you will now have some time to go through questions 31 to 40. So in the last section or last part always, you have to go through all the 10 questions. So you need a little more time here. So what you can do is, and at the end of part three, when you finish going through your answers, you can go a little earlier to part four and start reading through the questions. Every correct answer carries one mark and your answers should also be spelled correctly. If there's an answer which is wrongly spelled, even though the sound or the, uh, the um, what you heard is correct, but there can be a lot of sound alikes, there can be a lot of homophones where they have different spellings, but uh, same sounds. So your spelling should be correct and appropriate to the context of what you're listening to. Here are the types of questions which would be seen in a listening test. You would get multiple choice questions. You can have fill in the blanks, like form, uh, completing the form, completing a table, completing a sentence, completing a, a notes, and so on. These are all fill in the blanks kinds of questions. You can also get map labeling kinds of questions or labeling a plan or diagram. The questions have to be answered as per the instructions given. So you have to read the question, what is the task, the word limit. So if they ask you to write no more than three words, you can write three, two, or one, but you cannot write four words. And you have to make sure you have, if there is a number also, like you can write three words and or a number, one word could be, one number could be added to the words. If there's no word required, you can just write only a number and that's just fine. Capital letters or block letters should be used in the OMR sheets. This is the OMR sheet. When you write here, write your answers all in capital letters. That is all capitals, which is called block letters. As I said earlier, you use a dark pencil so that it's clear. Don't use a light pencil because there won't be clarity. Use a nice dark 2HB pencil for the paper-based test. For computer-based test, you just have to type your answers. For the computer-based test, also you will get two minutes at the end to look at all your answers and check for any errors and make changes as required. Let's look at the next slide. These four parts have a certain pattern. For example, the difficulty of the conversation increases in an ascending order. Same like in reading, the first passage will be okay, second is tougher, and the third passage is the toughest usually. Even in listening, the first passage is okay, second is tougher than the first one, third is even more difficult than the first two, and the fourth passage or part would be the toughest. So the level of difficulty increases in ascending order of the conversations and parts. Now, what do these four parts contain? Part one is a conversation between two people set in an everyday social situation. So the scenario is a social situation and there will be a conversation between two people. Whereas part two is a monologue. A monologue is one person talking. Mono means single or one. One person talking. Dialogue is two people talking. So in part two, from questions 11 to 20, there will be one person talking and the situation will be, again, a social situation, same like part one. The only difference is here only one person is talking, whereas in part one, there's a conversation between two people. Now in part three, the situation changes. Here it's a discussion amongst two, three or four people, but the, it is set in an educational or a training context. It is not a social situation. So it could be, a, for example, a student counselor talking to a group of students, uh, informing them about the courses available in the university or college and things like that. Or it could be a group of students discussing their project work. It's a discussion of maybe two, three or four, maximum four people talking or discussing in an educational or training context. And the fourth part, again, from 31 to 40 is a monologue. One person talking, the situation is academic, it's an academic subject. So it could be a teacher teaching a group of students. It could be a lecturer giving a lecture to the college students. 
It could be a person on television talking to people, addressing people on some health issue. It is a monologue on an academic subject. So this is the pattern of the four parts in listening. Part one, part two, part three, part four. 10, 20, 30, 40. Totally 40 questions. Now let's look at some tips for listening. You have to follow the conversation in order to understand what the conversation is about. The conversation, you also have to identify what the speakers are talking. For example, it could be a house number, it could be a size of an object, it could be a color, shape of an object, description of some place or a person or, a, or an event. It could be any of these details. So you have to take care that you listen to the details and follow signpost words for upcoming information. When there's information which is which they're going to talk about, you will also hear some signpost words. In the slide after the next one, I will show you some examples for signpost words. Now let's look at the word limit here. Suppose the instruction says, you have to complete the sentence in no more than two words. The correct answer, if it is leather coat, if you write coat made of leather, it would be marked incorrect because you have exceeded the word count. You are supposed to write no more than two words, but here it has become four words. Though the meaning is the same, but the word limit has exceeded what has been prescribed to you. You are supposed to pay attention to the word limit and follow the instructions given very carefully and very correctly. If it exceeds the word limit, it would be marked incorrect. So you have to write what you hear, leather coat. So just write leather coat because you're supposed to write no more than two words. It can be less, but not more than two words. And another example is, if the question asks you to complete the note in the dash, in the is printed, there's a dash there, blank. You have to fill the blank. And if the answer is morning, in the morning, you should note that if you write in the morning in this answer sheet, when you transfer your answers, if you transfer the entire phrase in the morning, that would be marked incorrect because your answer, which you wrote, was only morning. In the is already printed. So in the is not part of your answer. You should write only morning and not in the morning. Here are the signpost words, words which we talked about in the previous slide. Map labeling, diagram labeling, graph labeling, plan labeling. You would need to use signpost words. Now, when you go on a highway, when you're uh, going to a different place, you're going on the road, you, even in the cities, let alone highways, you see constantly there are there are posts everywhere. They have arrow marks and they show you the directions, which direction leads to which place. And the name of the place would be written on that signpost. So that's a signpost. Now the words which denote signposts are directional terms like go straight ahead, turn right, turn left, in the middle of, to the right side of, under, over, beside, to the north of, to the south of, to the east of, to the west of. All these give you the directions. So when you have a map on your screen or on your paper and you have to label that map, you will have some landmarks already printed on the paper. You have to just fill in the words which are missing. So only if you understand the signpost words in between, you will know in which direction to go to and what you have to write in that blank space given there. So you have to correlate the, the words there already, the signpost words, and follow that direction and write the words which are missing. You could also object, a description, color of a library, opposite the library. So opposite is a signpost word. Opposite the library, there's a park. So the, you see the park is already written on the map. Then they may say next to the park, there's a school. So next to, so next to is a signpost word. And then there you have to write some word which is missing. Or they may say across, across the bridge. Or they may say there's a tall, uh, there's a three-story green building. So three-story is the size of the object. The building is the object. Size, three stories. Shape, they may say the color, green is the color of the object. Sometimes they may say a shape, there may be a roundabout, there may be a circle, which is the shape. So you get all these used as signpost words for the map labeling kinds of questions. 
you have to also under, understand the word stress and intonation because it's a listening test. You have to pay attention to where they are stressing on words. Uh, so in a sentence, we have voice modulation and intonation. We may say some things with a rising tone, some words in a falling tone. So wherever they stress on a word, most probably the answer would be that word. So pay attention, keenly listen to the words which have been stressed on. For example, if it is said, Tom is going to the market and you see here, Tom is underlined. So, <coughs> excuse me, Tom is the person. So if say who is going to the market, Tom is going to the market. Tom is being stressed on here. Suppose the question is, where is Tom going? Then they would stress on market. Tom is going to the market. So Tom is going to the said very fast. And the word stressed on is said louder, elongated, and emphasized upon. So those are called word stressed uh, parts of the sentence. You need to listen out for these word stressed sentences. You also have to infer the meaning from the speech. Especially in multiple choice questions, where there is a question and, num and a number of options, they will not give the exact sentence which is in the option in the audio file. So they will say the whole uh, topic, they will talk about the topic in different ways. You have to listen to the entire talk or conversation. And from their talk, you have to infer the meaning and choose the correct option from the list of options given which means you have to understand from context. That's the meaning of inference. You infer the meaning. You also have to identify synonyms, same like reading. There are a lot of synonyms being used and be equipped with meanings of difficult words. You have to start learning vocabulary or improve your vocabulary skills by learning new words. Vocabulary lists have been given to you in the class. In your Dropbox, they have also been shared so you can learn new words every day and equip yourself with new words let your lexical resources let your word bank become richer and identify the synonyms so what they're saying the audio file would be a different word from what you see on the paper or on the question booklet so you have to identify that these two words mean the same and you have to choose your answer read the questions beforehand and predict the forms of the missing words so you predict the form is the word in the blank, it should, be a, should it be a noun form? Should it be a verb form? Should it be an adjective or an adverb? These are the four content words which will, could come in the blanks. So you have to predict by the sentence structure. Once the audio starts playing, you have to listen out for those words. If a noun has to come, you listen out for the noun. If you think an action has to come, listen out for the action. That's how you can predict. Predict what form of word can be in the blank based on the grammatical structure. All the words in the blank should be grammatically complete and correct. Be aware of distractors here. Distractors means they may say an answer and you would write the answer thinking it is perfectly correct, it sounds correct and good, and you write it. But one sentence after that, in the audio file, they may say, however, but, and change the answer. So the changed answer is the correct answer. Because they have said, however, they have negated the first part and they are focusing on the second part. So even after you write the correct answer, please wait till the end to listen to the details which follow that and see if they change track. If they change track, you have to change your answer as well. And you in your uh, question booklet, you can strike it and write it. But in the answer sheet, you write it only once here, neatly, correctly, after you're writing in your rough paper. That is the reason why they give you time at the end to write all your answers neatly. They give you a lot of time where you can write all your short forms or any codes, you can write it in full form without any symbols like and, you can't use ampersand symbol, you have to write A-N-D, you cannot write any short forms here, all the words have to be uh, spelled out correctly. The other distractor that they, they could use is, they would say the correct answer right at the end, so they would keep you waiting, listening and listening for 10 or 15 seconds, you keep listening and then the answer would come right at the end. So by then, sometimes some people give up listening. They lose concentration and they think, oh, I've missed the answer. They think they've missed the answer, but the answer comes right at the end. So please keep listening till the end because a distractor is just to see. They're assessing our uh, concentration skills to see whether we are listening up to the end. So be patient, listen till the end. And if you find the answer 
during that talk, you write it. If you do not find the answer as well, you can take a guess, but don't leave it unanswered because there's no negative marking. Even if the answer is wrong, it's zero. If you don't answer it, it's also zero. So you just take a guess and take a chance. By chance, if you write guess correctly, you'll get one mark. If it's wrong, it's zero. So every correct answer carries one mark. It's 40 out of 40 totally. Here again, your total raw score is converted to a band score. And the band scores are conversion tables are provided to you in your Dropbox. Now let's look at some more tips. Use correct spelling. As points are lost for incorrect spelling. If there are long, difficult, or foreign words, they usually spell them out in the audio file. Next point is multiple choice questions. You can use elimination technique. That is, if you see some answer or option is obviously wrong, just cross it off, eliminate it. And listen, keep listening with the options in front of you. Keep a bird's eye view. Like a bird looks at everything below from a global point of view. You look at all the options as they're talking, look at the list of options. And at the end, you can mark all your answers. Or as you're listening, if you find some answers are true, you can mark them. If you want to change them, you can always cross them off and choose a different answer because at the end, you always have time to transfer the correct answers. Mm -hmm. Here's the date format for listening. When a date is dictated, you have to write it in this form, dd dot mm dot y y y y only single dots are allowed no slashes no colons no da no dashes like 23 dash so if the, if the uh, date dictator is 23rd january 2022 you write 23 single dot 01 single dot 2022 slashes and dots are not allowed if the year is not dictated if only the month and date is dictated you can write it in this form ordinal number 23rd space january in full form no short forms or 23 January, January 23rd, or January 23. If they're dictating the month first, you can write the month first. There is a time format. Again, you have to use single dots. For example, if the time is 8.30 at night, you write 8, single dot, 30 p.m. p.m. can be in small letters or capital letters. And if there's no minutes, if it's only 11 or 11, uh, 12 or 9 or 10, you don't need to write dot zero zero. You can just write 11 a.m. or p.m. If one is small letter, both have to be small or both can be capital letters. Both are accepted. You can write it next to the number. It's counted as one number. It's one unit, a.m. and p.m. So colons are not allowed, like two dots. They're not allowed for the time in IELTS exam. So only single dots are allowed. And 24 hour format is not acceptable. You can't write 13.30 for 1.30. You have to write 1.30 p.m. 1.30 p.m. Thank you for listening to these listening tips. Now I'll share my screen and I'll show you the answers for book 10, test one. And I'll also show you in the audio script where the answers are marked. Later, you can do an exercise. Uh, you can do a listening test and go back to the audio script and answers and see how the uh, audio scripts are explained and how you need to listen out for the words. And please do exercises from book number seven, eight, and nine for your practice before you join the regular class. This will give you good exposure and practice, be confident in answering the questions. For listening, you need a lot of practice, so keep listening to a lot of uh, YouTube channel, English movies, anything that you can listen to, expose yourself to any uh, talks, conversations, songs in English would help you. And listen to various accents, various accents, like different country accents, because these audio files could be dictated by people from various countries. So you never know what accent you're going to get. So please keep practicing and improve your listening skills. Thank you. Now I'm going to share my screen with you with the answers for book 10, test one, listening. You can do this test later just for practice, even though you know the answers, that's just fine. You can just understand and do it for your exposure. Adle, newspaper, theme, tent, castle, beach or beaches, they accept both singular and plural. Sometimes they don't accept both 
For example, the second answer, if it's newspapers, they will not accept it because they have dictated only newspaper. Whereas here, both beach and beaches would be all right grammatically and contextually. Seventh answer is 2020. Eight is flight. Nine, 429. Dinner. 11 and 12 is multiple choice answers. So you can choose two answers from the list. So whether you write A and C or C and A in either order, both will be accepted as correct. Then you have... Uh, 13th one is health problems, then safety rules. Plan, joining, free entry, peak, guests, photo card or photo cards, both are correct. 21 is C, then A, B, 24A, 25C. 26 presentation, 27 model, 28 both material and materials are accepted as correct, 29 grant, 30 technical, 31 gene, 32 power and powers both are accepted, 33 strangers, 34 erosion, islands, roads, fishing, reproduction, 39 method or methods both are accepted and 40 is expansion. Uh, and I've shared the answers with you. You please do this test again. And I will also share with you how the answers are explained at the end of your book in the audio script. At the end of every book, you have audio scripts. So here is the audio script for this particular test. You can always, after doing a test, check your answers. So this is book 10, section one. The first one is Ardley. Now, why they write the answer like this is A-R-D-L-E-I-G-H is because they have dictated the spelling in the audio file. Because it's a name of a road and it's not a name which everyone would know. It is a name of a road in a particular country, in a particular city maybe. So everyone will not be familiar with the spelling of this particular road. Therefore, they spell it out. There are some words which are foreign words or difficult words which they would spell out. But they will not spell out all answers. General English words should be spelled correctly by you. You're expected to know the spellings of the general words. Second answer is here. So if you look at the audio script, question number one is shown on the right side, Q1, and the answer is underlined here, Ardley. Then you see question two, here it is underlined, newspaper. Question three, theme. Question four, tent. Question five, castle. Question six, beaches. Seven is 20, 2020 kilometers. Eight is flight. Nine is 429. So pound is already typed there, it's printed. So you have to write only the number 429. Don't write this pound symbol in your answer sheet here because if you write the pound symbol, which is not your answer, it will be marked wrong. But the answer is only 429. Pound is already typed. So you don't have to transfer the pound symbol here. You have to only transfer the answers which you write in your own hands. That Only that is your answer. 10 is dinner here. 11 and 12 are uh, the MCQ, so they are explained over here. 11 is here, 12 is here. It can be either way. It can be 12, 11. They could be interchanged. And you have all the answers here. 11, 12, 13. Section 2 is here from 11 till 20. The question numbers would be on the right side and the answers are marked on the left side. They are underlined. All the answers are underlined. So it's easy for you to go back and do a study, reflective study of your wrong answers. And you can do the tests again until you get all correct. Here is section three. Section three is from 21 to 30. You see the answers all written on the side, question numbers with the underlined answers. And here you get the whole script. Whatever is being spoken in the audio file is written here. A conversation between John and the professor. John and professor, what they say is exactly printed over here. So you have the exact written file, written script for what you heard. So even if the accent was difficult, if you couldn't follow something, or if they're too fast, you can always come back here and read the script and understand what they have spoken. All the books from book 7 to 14 have the audio scripts at the end of your book. Please do the tests and refer back 
for the answers. The answer keys at the back along with the explanations like this with the audio scripts. Here we end with question 30. Now we come to the fourth section or fourth part from question 31, 32, 33. The answers are all underlined here. They are explained because they must be MCQs, 35. So from which part of the conversation the answer is extracted, that is explained. So that is why you have long sentences underlined over here. 38, 39, and we have 40 here. So this is the end of book 10, listening test one. If you have further questions, please note them down and write them in your book. When you come back to the classes, when you start your regular classes, please approach your trainers, ask for whatever questions you have and get your doubts clarified and keep learning. Wish you all all the best. This is the end of the listening <laughs> briefing class. Meet you all in the class shortly. Thank you very much. All the best.